My name is Matthew Pierce. I am the National Register Coordinator uh, at the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been here for about a year, started in September of 2021. And so this is now, I guess, the third time that I've gone through this, uh, this workshop. Uh, we offer these programs uh, biannually, once in the spring and once in the winter. And so this presentation in particular is more of the, the big picture in terms of what the National Register is, what it does and does not do, the National Reg the, the criteria for significance, uh, integrity, and and that type of thing in terms of just in, in terms of just the big picture. And then tomorrow I have a workshop scheduled for uh, how to research how to research your historic property. So kind of to go more into the details to say, okay, you have this property, how how to best how is it to, how would you go about researching? Um, that property in order to, uh, you know, create uh, a nomination form. So, so with that, I'm going to turn off my webcam so it doesn't eat up our bandwidth. And um, I have created um, breaks throughout the presentation. Uh, please provide questions or comments in the chat or the Q&A um, throughout the presentation. Um, Tiffany Dorada is in the back in the background monitoring the chat, and she'll let me know if. Um, you know, as questions arise, and then I can take those questions um, as they come. We've blocked out two hours for this. Uh, in my experience now, it seems like this, generally the presentation takes about an hour, and then we can all, that, but that does give us some flexibility in terms of, of questions, or if there's any topics in particular that you'd like to go more in more detail about, feel free to ask those questions. All right, so Tiffany, if you could please start the recording. And let's start the show. So we'll start with some frequently asked questions about the National Register of Historic Places. First, who can nominate a property to the National Register? And so except under special circumstances, the State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO, is the only person with the authority to nominate properties to the National Register. There are a couple caveats to this. One, if a tribal government has assumed SHPO duties on tribal land under Section 101D2 of the National Historic Preservation Act, the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, or TIPO, becomes the nominating authority for properties under the tribe's jurisdiction. Uh, the TIPO is the tribal official appointed by the tribe's chief governing authority or designated by a tribal ordinance or preservation program who has assumed all or any part of the responsibilities of the SHPO on tribal lands in accordance with the National Historic Preservation Act. The other caveat is federal agencies. Federal agencies can nominate properties uh, in their ownership to the National Register of Historic Places. But if it doesn't meet either of those caveats, then um, it's only under special, except under special circumstances, the SHPO is the only person with the authority to nominate properties to the National Register. The next question though, who can prepare a property or, or who can prepare a nomination for a property to the National Register of Historic Places? And the response to that question is anyone. Anyone can prepare a, a nomination for any property and submit the nomination package to our office. Um, our office reviews and processes all nominations received in accordance with National Park Service regulations and the relevant standards and guidelines. Now, our office encourages individuals preparing National Register nominations to involve property owners in the project and to work with the SHPO to provide accurate information to property owners about the National Register process and their rights in that process. Um, and several of the handouts that I had that I have available for you all to download address many of those frequent, many of those questions or concerns that property owners may have about um, their property being listed on the National Register. So, um, if you're interested in preparing nomination, you know, make sure you reach out to the property owner. Make sure you're in touch with our office, and we can, you know, go along and go along with that process. Can an owner object to the listing of the property in the National Register? Yes, they can. Property owners have the right to object to the listing of their property. If a simple majority of private owners provide a statement to our office that they are the sole or partial owner of a specific property, 
and that they object to its listing in the National Register under penalty of perjury, it will not be listed. When a majority of property owners file such objections with our office by the deadline specified in the notice to property owners, our office will complete a formal review of the nomination under Park Service regulations. However, the keeper of the register or the National Park Service will issue a determination of eligibility rather than formally list the property. So again, there are some caveats to this. Um, one caveat being public property owners. So think uh, municipal or county government. Um, public property owners may not support the nomination of their property. However, their objection does not prevent formal listing of that property to the National Register. So how does the nomination process work? Our office reviews each nomination received. And I basically just keep a queue and as nominations come in, I review them as I receive them. If it is complete and in acceptable format, it will be scheduled for presentation at the earliest possible Historic Preservation Review Committee. Unacceptable or incomplete nominations will be returned to the preparer with written comments. Reviews for nominations typically occur within uh, between 30 and 45 days. Um, the notification, so let's say I receive a, typically how the process works is I'll receive a draft nomination. Within 30 to 45 days, I provide written comments to that nomination, submit it back to the preparer for revision. The repair takes as much time as they need to complete the revisions. They send it back to me. I do one last review again within 30 to 45 days and then schedule it for uh, the next, the, the, the upcoming Historic Preservation Review Committee meeting. Now, notification of property owners uh, of consideration of the nomination of their property um, at the Historic Preservation Review Committee uh, must occur at least 30 days before the meeting. I also have to forward all finalized nominations to committee members 30 to 45 days in advance of those review committee meetings. So basically as the next bullet point there states, our review committee meets um, quarterly. They meet on the third Thursday of January, April, July, and October. To, basically speaking, I need to have, if, let's say if I need to have it, let's say a nomination is going to be considered. So for instance, we have our upcoming meeting in January of 2023. Um, the nominations that are being considered for that review committee meeting have to be finalized six, at least 60 days prior to that January meeting. So essentially I had to have all those nominations, we're considering four nominations at that meeting. Those nominations had to be finalized um, you know, late October by, by late October, early November at the latest. So that's always something to keep in mind as you're preparing nominations is, you know, I have these deadlines and I have regulations to meet in terms of notifying property owners, making sure our review committee has the nominations on time so they have plenty of time to review them. And so typically um, I have to have nominations finalized 60 days before um, our review committee meets. Now, after uh, our review committee meetings, uh, nominations typically go through one last round of technical edits to account for comments from the committee or comments that were received by the general public. And so um, if a committee's comments on a nomination are more substantive, the nomination may be returned to the preparer to address those comments. Um, otherwise, typically within 15 or 20 days after the review committee meets, um, the State Historic Preservation Officer approves the nomination and it's sent to the keeper of the register in Washington, D.C. Um, written comments received before or during the committee meeting will be transmitted with the nomination to the keeper of the register. Basically, that way they have all the same information that the committee had when they were reviewing the nomination. From there, the keeper of the register has 45 days from the date of receipt of nomination to act. And the keeper can do one of one of three things. List the property in the National Register, issue a determination of eligibility in special circumstances, or reject the property for listing, or return the nomination for additional information or clarification. And that last point that does come in uh, that we do have that happen where 
um, a nomination is approved by the committee. It's gone through a couple of rounds of revisions. And in some cases, still, the nomination is sometimes returned by the National Park Service um, for clarification or something like that, so or, or additional information. If the nomination um, is listed, the keeper notifies our office um, that the nomination is that the property is listed on the National Register. I get a weekly update from National Park Service of all the properties get, that get listed in the United States. And then our office um, notifies all property owners and elected state and local officials of the designation. We also inform the owner uh, and the nomination preparer when a property is listed or if the nomination is returned for additional information. So regardless, I, I keep uh, the preparers and the property owners notified of where the nomination is within the process. Just for information, this does, you know, I do get this question sometimes, you know, with the National Register of Historic Places, that is the official name, you know, National Register of Historic Places or National Register. The National Register is not the National Historic Registry. It's not the historical list. It's not the National Trust. It's not the Historical Society listing or any of a number of other labels. It is the National Register of Historic Places. And then what does the National Register does not do? So the National Register does not restrict the use of the property. It does not restrict the sale of private property. It does not require continued maintenance of private property. It does not require that any specific guidelines be followed in rehabilitation. It does not require the owner to give tours of the property or open it to the public. It does not guarantee funds for restoration. It does not guarantee perpetual maintenance of the property. It does not provide a tax credit for private residential structure and it does not provide a historic marker for the property. Once a property is listed in the National Register, our issue, our, our excuse me, our office issues a, uh, a certificate that's signed by the governor, the secretary of state, um, the executive director of the, of the Historical Society, the, the chairman of the board for the Historical Society. Um, it's a formal certificate, but we do not, uh, you know, if I go back to the previous slide, we have the, you know, I showed the, the plaque that you commonly see um, on listed buildings. Our office does not finance or provide um, those plaques, but those plaques are offered um, by a variety of, of vendors and a number of property owners, you know, after their property is listed, they, they do go ahead and, and purchase um, the plaque, whether it's from uh, an outside vendor or they can, you know, acquire it locally. Uh, from a local foundry or another vendor as well. So if that's what the National Register does not do, here's basically what the National Register does. The National Register provides recognition of a property's significance in history, architecture, archaeology, or engineering. It provides limited protection when a property is endangered by federal undertakings. Um, in parentheses here, Section 106, that's Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, our office just finished last week doing a, a series of, of webinars on the Section 106 process and properties that are listed in the National Register um, can, you know, they, they do receive limited protection um, if a property is endangered by a federal undertaking. National Register can provide the owner of an income producing property the opportunity to receive investment tax credits for a certified rehabilitation. We do have presentations uh, later this week by Sarah Wernicke, who will be going into more detail about the tax credit process and what exactly a certified rehabilitation is. And lastly, the National Register listing can provide the owner an opportunity to apply for matching grant and aid for restoration, rehabilitation, and then the caveat, when such funding is available. You know, regarding grants, uh, matching grants from our office are currently not available. They will not be available in the near future. However, there are grant programs available through the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the National Park Service. Um, also, don't forget about various grants and, and loans that are available through other state uh, local or federal entities um, and you can contact our office about uh, for information about those various programs 
given from the polls, it seems like there would be an appetite for a presentation just about, you know, grants and the National Register and, you know, just what what funding avenues are out there for listed properties. And so that's something that we'll, we'll, we'll work on and get a presentation together for um, in, the, in the near future, because that is one of the main questions um, that I get. So after that introduction, I'll pause really briefly. Um, it looks like we may have, uh, if we have any, da, 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 da. so Jeanette uh, posted in the, the Q&A, uh, Jeanette Perez, that they've just bought an old Masonic Lodge in Marietta, Oklahoma. Oh, great. I am very familiar with, with Marietta. Um, I believe it was built in 1904, and they're interested in learning about whether our building qualifies to be registered with the National Register. So, Jeanette, I hope this presentation uh, provides some nice some context for you about that, and um, feel free to reach out to me after the presentation because it's quite possible we have some documentation on that building already. So, um, we'll take a reach out to me after the presentation, and we'll um, we'll look into that. <clears throat> okay, so I am a historian by training, and so presentation like this wouldn't be complete without at least a brief history of the National Register itself, where it came from, <coughs> and so forth, excuse me. So the National Register is a product of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. It was enacted by the 89th U.S. Congress and signed into law by President Johnson in 1966. Two key takeaways from that act. First, it acknowledged the importance of protecting national heritage from federal development. So historic preservation in general had been, has been around with the United States in, as, in really since the founding of, of the United States. Um, the key thing about the act itself was that it acknowledged the importance of protecting national heritage from development, and it integrated historic preservation into federal planning processes. Now, why did it go about doing this? The common narrative is because it was the act was written in response to the widespread demolition of historic resources. You know, a couple of more recent photos that I have here from Founders Bank and Stage Center in Oklahoma City. You know, this demolition continues today. Um, we often get, you know, it's often in the news about a building, you know, a notable building in Oklahoma getting demolished. Um, and so, you know, the National Historic Preservation Act was was enacted in part in, in response to widespread demolition of historic resources, um, namely associated with these three trends, these three trends, infrastructure improvements. Um, you think mid 20th century, this is when you have the interstate highway system uh, being constructed and expanded. You're seeing widespread residential and commercial development, particularly in um, suburban areas and also with urban renewal. So widespread demolition in downtown areas to, to facilitate new residential and commercial development and continued industrial development. The act states in part that the preservation of historic property, quote, is in the public interest. So that is vital legacy of cultural, educational, inspirational, economic, and energy benefits will be maintained and enriched for future generations of Americans. And so the National Register of Historic Places was one of the key products of the Historic Preservation Act. It is a catalog of buildings, structures, sites, objects, and districts significant in American history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, or culture. And it is National Park Service regulations that govern the National Register of Historic Places nomination process. One of the key other things that the Historic Preservation Act created was the state historic preservation offices. So state of Oklahoma, other states, this is, you know, the act has created those, um, you know, those SHPOs and the SHPOs work in uh, collaboration with the National Park Service with TIPOs uh, to, to, to facilitate uh, the National Register and other programs that are fostered by the National Historic Preservation Act. So what can be listed in the National Register? Buildings, structures, sites, 
objects, and districts. And the program provides specific definitions for what each of these things mean. So let's start with buildings. Buildings, put simply, those that you know, they're designed to house people and their activities. So I have a photo here of the Greer County Courthouse in Mangum. Uh, it's listed uh, under as part of our County Courthouses of Oklahoma nomination. And so think of the wide range of, of human activities that take place in buildings, residential, governmental, military preparedness, commercial, you know, any activity that can take place within a building that um, buildings are defined in, in that way. They're designed to house people and their activities. Now they may be, um, we have a wide range of, of building types. You know, they may be of vernacular design, but of historic importance. And so we have on the right here, the Saline, the Saline Courthouse in Delaware County. That was built in 1884. That was a district, served as a district court for criminal cases and civil matters that involved less than $100. And on the left, we have the Reverend L.W. Thomas Homestead in Muskogee County. Uh, it was built in 1922, and it was, it was recently listed in the National Register for its association with Reverend L.W. Thomas, who founded the all-black town of Summit in Muskogee County. So buildings may be of more vernacular design, but historic importance, and they also can represent uh, buildings that have distinctive design. And so Oftentimes when people think of the National Register, um, oftentimes it's a building on the left that they think of, that they think of. It's kind of one of those things that instantly come to mind. This is the A.W. Patterson House in Muskogee. It was built in 1906. It was listed um, as an outstanding example of the Richardsonian Romanesque architectural style. And this is commonly when people when people think of the National Register, they oftentimes think of these you know, grand courthouses, grand homes designed in those revival styles of the early 20th century. Uh, you know, we are getting into you know, the era where many more of our mid 20th century properties are, are eligible or mid 20th century buildings. And so the building on the left, on the right is the Liberty Federal Savings and Loan Building in Enid. Uh, it was built in 1964 and it's significant as an excellent local example of the international architectural style. You know, it's clearly defined, articulated there with the, the horizontal the emphasis on the on the horizontal form, the flat roof, um, and so forth. So, what about those things that are designed for purposes other than containing people, structures? Um, so, think bridges, for instance. This is the Bridgeport Bridge in Caddo County along Route 66 significant for its association with Route 66 and for its design and construction. Uh, specifically, as you can see in the photograph, the series of 38 identical Camelback Pony Trust spans. Structures, that the structures that we often see listed in the National Register are often engineering resources. So think bridges, also um, dams. This is the photograph of the Lake Overholzer Dam in Oklahoma County. Um, Road bread, uh, or excuse me, road beds, um, and any type of engineering resource, you know, those often fall under the category of structures. Um, they may be purely functional. So think of a grain elevator. Um, a grain elevator qualifies as a structure, not necessarily a building, because it's it's meant to to house. It's meant to hold grain essentially. So it's classified as a structure. This is an image of the terminal elevator. Uh, terminal elevators in Enid in Garfield County. Um, sites or the location acti or of, of activities important in history. Again, it's can this can run the range as as we'll see. So the photograph here is of Rock Mary in Caddo County. Um, it's a natural tower of red sandstone. Um, that served as a navigation as a navigational landmark for overland travelers through western Oklahoma, as recorded in travel diaries and other documents. So it's a natural landscape that attained significance for its um, for its association with exploration and settlement in western Oklahoma. Sites can possess um, archaeological value. So, for instance, in western Oklahoma, there are um, a couple of, of archaeological um, sites. Uh, they were prehistoric bison kill sites that are listed in the National Register. Um, the one pictured here is of the Cooper Bison Kill Site 
in Harper County. Um, there's also the, the Harold Bison kill site in Ellis County. Um, so sites can possess archaeological value or historic or cultural value. And so this is a photograph of the Fort Gibson National Cemetery in Muskogee County. Um, Fort Gibson was a significant military post in present day Oklahoma. The National Military Cemetery pictured here was established in 1868, and it's listed at the national level of significance for its association with Civil War era cemeteries. So again, sites can run the gamut from natural, natural features, think Rock Mary, uh, the Antelope Hills, uh, archaeological sites to um, cemeteries or, or other sites, other places that have attained um, historic or cultural value. Objects. These are things that are primarily small in scale, often artistic, but not necessarily static. So what I have pictured here are a couple of the are more notable objects um, that are individually listed in the National Register. I mean, these are forms of statuary. This is um, the, to the left, we have the Pioneer Woman statue in Ponca City in Kay County. And on the right is the Spirit of the American Doughboy statue in Muskogee, uh, in Muskogee County. It was, uh, it's there standing there in front of the, the Veterans Hospital in Muskogee. And so these are a couple of instances where, you know, objects that are individually listed um, in the National Register, either for their um, significance for art or for their association with historic events, um, more often than not, however, objects will contribute to the character of a historic district. So they would be considered contributing to a historic district. And so, for instance, here we have a couple of, of signs, you know, stone signs uh, in Roberts Cave State Park Historic District. On their own, you know, the restroom sign on the on the left or the, the group camp sign on the right, you know, on, on its own, you know, these objects wouldn't necessarily have the necessary integrity or significance to merit individual eligibility. But when they're part of a, of a larger whole, when they're part of a collection or node of similarly associated objects or structures or buildings, you know, then you're thinking then they can be included as part of a as part of a historic district. And so if you are working on a historic district nomination, that's always something to be keeping in mind is not just paying attention to the buildings or the notable structures, but it's also things like these, you know, the signs um, or any other kind of objects that can also contribute to the historic character of a district. And so that brings us to our last category of properties. So, so districts. Districts are contiguous or in some cases discontiguous areas made up of multiple buildings, sites, structures, and objects that are related. And so in the case of Roberts Cave in, you know, on the previous slide, you know, those objects were related to the overall construction of the association, the construction of several resources in the park by the Civilian Conservation Corps, think cabins, think bridges, you know, those types of things. So they were all part of this larger collective. Um, districts are oftentimes residential or commercial. So in the upper left, um, it's a photograph of the Newkirk, Oklahoma Central Business District in, in Newkirk in Kay County. Um, you know, so that's a good example of a commercial district. Um, lower right, we have the Jefferson Park Historic District in Oklahoma City. Um, good example of a, a, of a residential historic district. They can also be agricultural or designed landscapes. So this is a photograph of the Woodward Park and Gardens Historic District in Tulsa. Basically for a district to be a district, it needs to be any combination of resources united historically or aesthetically by plan or physical development. And so like what I have pictured here is a photograph of the Sydney and Mary Lyons Residence and Commercial Historic District in Oklahoma City. It essentially comprises four, four buildings. Uh, in the foreground is, you know, a large, I believe it was, a, it was built in 1926, uh, mansion that was built by Sidney Lyons, who was a notable African-American entrepreneur in Oklahoma City. Uh, to the left in the background, you can see uh, um, a, a bungalow that was 
built, I believe, a decade prior to the residence, and it was a, a house that Lyons owned and used as a rental property. Uh, to the right, you can see kind of the outlines of a, of a, of a frame commercial building um, that was uh, Sydney Lyons' storefront and manufacturing facility. He uh, made, a, made a fortune from selling um, hair products and, 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 other, and other things for, um, for Deep Deuce in the African-American community in, Af in Oklahoma City and throughout Oklahoma. And so listed together for their you know, historic association with Sydney Lyons and his business enterprises. Uh, his wife, Mary uh, Lyons, would continue the business after Sydney passed. And so, again, it's this relatively small property, but classified as a district because it includes multiple buildings who are united historically for their historic association with the Lyons family. So I'll pause here for any questions or comments. So again, feel free to add questions or comments in the chat or in the Q&A as I'm going through this presentation. And if we don't have any, I will forge ahead. Okay, so we've talked about, in general, you know what the National Register does and does not do. We've talked about the the basic pro the the basic categories of properties, buildings, structures, sites, objects, and districts. So essentially, what can be listed, what happens, you know how how, how to go through a nomination, what happens, you know when a property is listed. Um, so let's talk in in some detail about you know. Well, how do we go about evaluating um, a property that may be eligible for the National Register? What makes a property eligible for the National Register? And there are two key things we look for. The first is significance. Um, there are three levels of significance. Um, there is, and again, I think this is another common misconception about the National Register program. Um, for properties that are listed in the National Register, I think people often assume that, oh, it must be a property that's of, of national significance. Uh, and so a lowly building in rural Oklahoma may not may not qualify because you know it, it's not well known outside of that community. And that that's not necessarily the case. Um, there are three levels of significance that we can use for uh, National Register evaluation. One level is, of course, the national level of significance or a property that demonstrates significance within a national context. There's also a statewide level of significance or those properties that demonstrate significance within um, a statewide context. Um, or there's the local level of significance or those properties that are evaluated within a local context. And even the term local can be um, apply differently. Um, we could look at, at local in terms of maybe it's it's the town itself. If it's maybe a rural property, um, maybe we're looking at it within the context of the county or maybe a certain part of a county. Um, and so those are just some, some things to, to keep in mind. At the end of the day, most properties in Oklahoma that are listed in the National Register are listed at the local level of significance. And so it's those properties that demonstrate importance uh, within the context of a local community. So local can be defined in certain ways, even community itself can be defined in certain ways. It's all about you know, what argument you're making. So, but most properties in the National Register are significant at the local level. And a property only needs to meet one level of significance. A property can, only needs to be significant locally, you know, statewide, or, or nationally, there are some instances where more than one level of significance can apply. You know, a property can be significant, um, let's say at the statewide level for architecture, but maybe locally significant for, or locally significant for um, social history or commerce or something like that. But typically, you only need to meet one level of significance in order to have 
an eligible property. So let's look at these levels of, of significance in greater detail. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's start with the national level. Now, those properties that demonstrate significance within a national context. So what photograph here is a good example of this. This is the Bazell Memorial Library uh, at the University of Oklahoma campus in Cleveland County. Um, it's listed in the National Register at the national level of significance. And so that means you know, a nationwide comparison had to be made for this building to reach that level of significance. In this case, it was a nationwide assessment of higher education properties significant to African-American civil rights. And in this building's case, specifically, the Library's Historic Association with George McLaurin and Ada Loa Sibyl Fisher and, and others who fought to, for the process of desegregation of OU's campus during the mid 20th century. Things to keep in mind for making a case for a property's national level of significance. The research must be scholarly and you need to think in terms of context development. If you cannot complete or if you cannot develop a complete national context for the resource type, for the resource type, do not attempt national uh, significance. Another way to think about this, this whole these different levels um, that oftentimes when I'm when I'm talking to folks, this is how I will lay it out. Um, to demonstrate a property of having national uh, significance, you know, think of that as like the equivalent of of a PhD level of research. Um, that's where you're going to need to go to you know do archival research. Um, you know, you're, you're going to need to do a lot of work in order to prove um, that na that national significance. Statewide level of significance, you're already looking at more of like a master's thesis level of of research and writing. You know, because you are having to evaluate that property within a statewide context, so you do have to keep that in mind. Local level of significance, um, you know, that could be the equivalent of say like an undergraduate thesis. Um, so like where because you're, you're working mainly with local sources local newspapers, local oral histories, um, everything's pretty much tied within that local community. You're not having to do a whole lot of research outside of that community to in order to establish the property significance. So oftentimes I'll, I'll indicate, use that example to just kind of help folks get a sense of the type of work that may be involved. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we still expect, you know, nominations to uh, to be consistent in quality in terms of writing and, and research. But in terms of like the amount of research you need to do or the, and that type of thing, you know, you can keep these, you know, keep that comparison in mind in terms of like how much you need to show for local level significance compared to say national level of significance. Um, keeping with our national level of significance, um, all national historic landmarks are nationally significant. And this may be a term that, or a category that some of you have heard of. Uh, What's pictured here is a photograph from the, the Guthrie uh, National Historic Landmark District. It was designated as a National Historic Landmark or NHL in 1999. Uh, the standard for NHLs are, are as follows. They must possess exceptional value or quality in illustrating and interpreting the heritage of the United States. And so they have to be evaluated within that national context. In the case of downtown Guthrie, received NHL status for its role in the settlement of Oklahoma and for its collection of pre-statehood and early statehood commercial, residential, and cultural architecture. There are currently fewer than 2,500 National Historic Landmarks in the United States. Oklahoma has 22. Um, Bizell Library that I meant that's in the former screen, the, in the previous screen, that's an NHL. Guthrie's an NHL. Uh, our most recent NHL is the Honey Springs Battlefield. Um, it was listed as an NHL in 2013. Okay, so that's the national level of significance. Let's look at um, the statewide level of significance. You know, those properties that are significant at a statewide level. Um, sometimes it can be fairly obvious. So at the center of the photo is the Oklahoma State Capitol. The Oklahoma State Capitol building was listed prior to the construction of the dome, of course, but it is listed in the National Register at the statewide level of significance for its obvious association, I guess, with state government. Um, 
building in the lower right hand corner is the Oklahoma Historical Society building. Uh, that's now the courts, uh, the Supreme Court building, but it's also listed in the National Register at the statewide level for its historic association with politics and government, specifically with the, the Oklahoma Historical Society. Um, there are a couple of buildings off to the left that are outside of, of, of the view of this photograph, um, the Oklahoma National Guard Armory uh, and the State Highway Department Testing Laboratory. Uh, both of those buildings are also listed in the National Register at the statewide level of significance. The Armory, of course, for its association with um, military preparedness of the Oklahoma National Guard prior to World War II. Uh, the Testing Laboratory for its development of uh, for its association with the Department of Transportation and road construction. Uh, you know, you know, road materials technologies. You know, that was where those materials got tested prior to to being um, installed. Um, you know, on the state's highways. So all those properties, you know, in, within the state capital complex are listed in the National Register at the statewide level. But the property doesn't necessarily have to be in the state capital for, uh, for it to meet eligibility uh, at the statewide level. Generally, these properties are viewed within a statewide context. And so on the photograph on the right here is a photograph of Old Central for all of you um, OSU alums out there. You're welcome. Um, I'm an OU grad, so that's why I had Bazell Library pictured pictured earlier. Um, but Old Central in Stillwater was the first permanent building on the campus of Oklahoma State University, formerly Oklahoma A&M. So it is listed in the National Register at the statewide level of significance. Um, a more recent, I guess I, you can say more recent, it's a mid 20th century building, um, but uh, to the left is the Lawton National Guard Armory. Um, it's listed at the statewide level of significance for its association with the Oklahoma National Guard during the Cold War. So again, property doesn't necessarily have to be in Oklahoma City for it to be listed at the statewide level of significance. Um, both of these properties are listed at the statewide level as well. Um, think about sites. We've spent a lot, but a lot of time on building, but this is a section of the, the Chisholm Trail in Canadian County. Uh, that's listed in the National Register at the statewide level for its association with the Chisholm Trail. All right. As I stated earlier, though, most listed properties in Oklahoma are significant at the local level. This is a photograph of the Cobb building in, in Wagoner. So let's spend some time on uh, the local level significance. You know, what does that mean? It means basically that those these are properties that are evaluated within the context of a local community. Um, I have a photograph here is, is a fairly unique nomination. This is a Fraser Cemetery uh, in the vicinity of Altus in Jackson County. It's listed uh, for its significance uh, or significant, I guess, for its association with the early settlement in Greer County. Um, the town site was abandoned in 1891 uh, due to flooding. Most of the town's residents um, relocated to the east to present-day Altus. The cemetery is the only um, extant resource associated with the former town site of Fraser, And so that's why it, uh, it merited a listing in the National Register. Again, if you're looking at this, this cemetery from, the, from a, a national or statewide context, you know, probably doesn't meet that those levels of significance but within a local context um, I think the the significance of the property is is fairly self-evident basically for these local these, these local properties reflect trends or events that impacted history at the local level and so these are these are the properties that you know you, we, we think about you know, if you think about when you're, if you're in your U.S. history courses or any history courses, you know, and you tend to talk about these these broad events that are that are in general detail, you know, think like the New Deal, the WPA, the the Civilian Conservation Corps, and at the local level, um, it's it's those buildings that kind of that reflect those those trends or events, and they clearly show the impact of those events at the local level. And so for instance, uh, this is a photograph of the um, armory building in Okima, uh, and it's listed at the local level of significance 
uh, for its association with the WPA and military preparedness on the eve of World War II. So again, you know, built as a product of, of national and in some in, in a way even international events or or built within those con within those contexts but you know evaluated within its you know evaluate at the local level to evaluate its impact at the local level and so the okima armory and numerous other the list could go on in terms of, of properties that are listed at the local level of significance and so that's why if you're looking at um, if, if you're evaluating properties knowledge of that local context is key in order to give a fair assessment of those properties. So we've established the different levels of significance, you know, national, statewide, or local. So what criteria are we looking at? So there are four criteria for evaluation for a national register nomination. So a property can be eligible at the national, you know, statewide or local level under criterion A, for its association with events, criterion B for its associations with persons, criterion C for design characteristics, or criterion D, the ability to yield important information, either prehistoric or historic. So again, each of those criteria you're looking at within a national, statewide, or local context. So let's look at these in a little bit greater detail. Criterion A, uh, properties that are associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our history. This can be a singular event or a continuum of events. And there is a broad list of events that qualify. And this is uh, the National Park Service uh, fairly frequently will revise or issue new um, events or new subcategories. Uh, for for certain events that that we as uh, at the state level can look at in terms of eligibility, but some of the more common um, examples of events uh, include commerce, education, agriculture, politics and government, ethnic heritage, and social history. And those latter two, there's a broad and growing uh, diversity of subcategories under those events. So ethnic heritage, you know, think like ethnic heritage, African American history, Native American history. Asian American history, um, for social history, um, you could think of like civil rights or, or you know other similar subcategories. And so this, there, it can be again a singular event or a continuum, a continuum of events or a trend essentially. Um, for a specific event, um, you know something that happens at a specific place or a specific time, think something like a battle. Um, and so like this is a photograph of the Washita battlefield in roger mills county you know something that it's a site that's associated with a specific um event um you know the surprise dawn attack against the southern cheyenne um, by george custer in 1868 you know, a very a very specific event associated within the you know that's associated with the broader uh, indian wars on the southern plains in terms of a continuum continuum of events I think something like commerce and so I, I know we have at least one person from main street um in the presentation today um you know commercial uh commercial main streets um, many are listed for their association with commerce the commercial development of those particular you know downtowns those those corridors um so like you know we don't think of it like that but but commerce is an event community planning and development is considered an event uh, so this is a photograph of the capitol hill commercial historic district in Oklahoma City. And it's listed under criterion A uh, for community planning and development and for commerce. Capitol Hill was, uh, and still is, it's a distinct neighborhood within Oklahoma City. Um, and so it was listed under criterion A just a few years ago for, for commerce and for community planning and development at the local level of significance. Education. Um, ethnic heritage are also considered events. You know, this is the Lincoln Colored School in Fairfax, Osage County. Uh, the photo taken on the left uh, was taken in 2003 when the property was listed. Uh, the photo on the right was submitted a few years ago as part of a Section 106 review process. Uh, the property is listed, um, again, at the local level of significance under Criterion A for education and for ethnic heritage 
for its role as a separate school open only to African-American children during the era of Jim Crow segregation. Criterion B, are those properties associated with the lives of persons significant in our past? Uh, the key thing to keep in mind here uh, is that the property must reflect the category in which the person made contributions uh, or made significant contributions. So let's say you're listing the house of a prominent um, writer or a prominent uh, town figure. Um, you know, the property needs to reflect uh, those significant contributions that that that, that individual made. Um, another thing to keep in mind for Criterion B is again, it, it is also subject to those different levels of significance. So um, the figure does not have to be um, a nationally or even statewide known figure. It can be a prominent local figure. Um, so so keep that keep that in mind. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that the property needs to best present needs to best represent the time period in which uh, the person attained significance. So if you think about, you know, people are born, people die, there's the, there's the period in between. You know, does the period, does the property best convey, um, you know, that individual's life uh, and the contributions that they made? So a couple of examples here, um, you know, the person must be significant, must, there must be a direct tie to the property. This is the Frank and Jane Phillips house in Bartlesville, you know, Frank Phillips of, of Phillips 66. Um, you know, so it's a property that's associated, that's directly associated with, with them. Um, another example is Kane's Ballroom in Tulsa. Um, the association between the property and the person must be direct and during the time when the person achieved significance. So Kane's is in part listed under criterion B for its association with Bob Wills. Bob Wills, prominent country musician, um, kind of helped Keynes attain um, its significance as a concert venue and a music, you know, a music venue in, in downtown Tulsa. And so, you know, it's a directly associated with Bob Wills during the time in which he attained significance as a country musician. Um, I will say in my reviews and nominations, Criterion B is oftentimes the hardest um, criterion to, to, it's the hardest argument to make. I mean, the property has to be um, directly attributed to that person during the time when they achieve significance. Sometimes that is a hard argument to make. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, criterion C, uh, properties that embody the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction, or that represent the work of a master, or that possess high artistic values, or that represent a significant and distinguishable entity whose components lack individual distinction. I just gave you a mouthful. Let's break it down in simple terms. Put simply, this criterion refers to the physical characteristics of a property. It's also typically the most common criterion used for evaluation. And so for that reason, it has different subcategories sub under which to evaluate properties. So let's look at, you know, I, I put those in bold. Let's look at those in a little greater detail. So first, distinctive characteristics of a type. So that can refer to the form, function, or use of a property. So this is the old Santa Fe Railroad Bridge uh, near Wanette. Uh, it's a Camelback through truss bridge. It's listed because it's an excellent representation of that form. Characteristics of a period. This is typically when we think about architectural styles. So um, it's a building that may best represent um, a specific architectural style. Again, that can be similar with the bridge uh, in the previous slide. We can look at that national context, statewide context, or local context. So this is a photograph of the W.T. Hales House in Oklahoma City. It's listed at the local level um, as an excellent representation of the classical revival architectural style. You can see that by uh, the fluted, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the fluted two-story columns, the roofline balustrade. Um, you know, it articulates many of the key features of 
a classical revival styled, um, you know, grand residence. So again, you know, when we think of, you know, Criterion C and architecture, it's usually these types of properties that many people think about, again, when they hear about the National Register, when they think about why properties are significant, you know, oftentimes um, it, is, it is architecture. So that's oftentimes what people think about. But it can also be um, representing uh, characteristics of a construction method. And again, that could represent, you know, those, it can, it can be the high styles that we saw in the previous slide. It also recognizes the importance of vernacular traditions. So on the left is a photograph of Beard Cabin in Shawnee. It was the first house built in Shawnee. Um, it's listed in, in part because of its log construction. You can kind of make out the, the square notches uh, in the in the log construction there uh, in the photograph. Um, to the right is the Schultz Neal Stone Barn in Noble County. It's the largest freestanding stone barn in the state, um, listed under Criterion C because of its uh, its it, its association you know with its with its construction. It's a freestanding stone barn, um, and so it's listed under Criterion C. Um, so it can recognize you know vernacular construction methods. Criterion C can also um, recognize new technologies or materials under that construction method um, category. So this is a photograph of a Lustron house. Uh, this is the Usher house in Cushing. Uh, the Lustron Corporation uh, basically made metal prefabricated houses uh, after World War II. It was uh, one of, of many different designs, uh, different companies that were out there, you know, that were trying to meet uh, the housing crisis following World War II when you have a bunch of veterans who are returning home and they're wanting to start families. And so you have companies like the Lustron Corporation, you know, design, um, you know, houses uh, to, to try to meet those needs. So like this is a completely um, metal house. Uh, and so listed, you know, listed under Criterion C, Forest Association, um, with that design construction, uh, with that construction method. Another subcategory under Criterion C is the work of a master, um, or this, you know, think of think of a notable architect. Uh, so it's the works of designers or craftsmen who are masters in their fields. So oftentimes we think about that in terms of notable architects. They may be nationally no nationally known. Uh, so on the left, for example, is uh, the Joyce House uh, in Kiowa County, which is considered to be one of the finest works of architect Herb Green. Uh, on the right is Price Tower in Bartlesville, um, associated with Frank Lloyd Wright. So they may be nationally known, or they may be of local importance. So I have a photograph of the Liberty Federal Savings and Loan Association building in Eded. Um, once again, it's listed um, under Criterion C, Forts Association with Thomas Rogers, um, who was a local architect. Uh, he designed several uh, Enid buildings uh, that utilized modern movement styles, uh, this being one of the best, uh, if not the best example of his work in Enid. Another subcategory being the um, high artistic value or property that possesses recognizable um, artistic value. Sometimes that can stand on its own. So on the left, for example, we have Ed Galloway's Totem Pole Park in Rogers County. Um, Galloway was among Oklahoma's premier folk artists. And so like, you know, the, the Totem Pole Park is itself individually listed in the National Register. Um, oftentimes though, uh, this subcategory, it may be um, a component of a larger entity. So think like stained glass windows. Uh, these, the stained glass windows that you see on the right are within the Y Chapel of Song on the University of Central Oklahoma campus. Um, students carved the pews, glazed and fired the ceramic tiles, and designed and crafted the stained glass windows that you see here. And the project architects designed the building around, or, or designed the building based on those windows. Um, another example, um, uh, for for a property or for something that would fall under this subcategory um, are New Deal era post offices that feature murals created by artists that were funded through the through the WPA program. So that's another example that falls under this you know high artistic value subcategory. 
And then the last, that, that last part of criterion C, you know, those, you know, it's a distinctive entity whose components lack individual distinction. Put simply, that covers our historic districts. So think commercial historic districts, um, you know, those types of things. It's, it's, it's those, it's those buildings or you know, those collection of resources that um, on their own lack distinctive, lack individual distinction. But when you look at them together, they convey um, significance under criterion C for design construction. Uh, so this is a photograph of Automobile Alley in Oklahoma City, listed in part under criterion C for its design and construction as a commercial historic district. One thing to keep in mind is that districts are considered a single entity, or you know, in other words, a property. Districts contain multiple resources, um, but those resources together comprise the district and the district itself is counted as a single property. Um, so that's always something to, to keep in mind. We may, like for instance, in Oklahoma, we have over 1400 properties listed in the National Register of Historic Places, but many of those properties contain a multiple number of resources. And typically speaking, resources within the district um, are generally not individually eligible. There are some exceptions to this, but generally they're not individually eligible. A good example here is what I have photoed, what I have pictured here is a stone culvert in Lake Murray State Park. It was built by the CCC. It was one of many culverts, bridges, and other features constructed by the CCC in Lake Murray during by the CCC during the 1930s on its own doesn't merit uh, individual distinction, but collectively it contributes to the historic significance um, of, of Lake Murray uh, State Park. <clears throat> Resources are considered contributing if they reflect the character of the district. So this is a photograph of a contributing resource within the White City Historic District of Tulsa. Um, this, Tulsa, this district is noted for its architecture, specifically the collection of Tudor Revival and minimal traditional styles that were, were constructed in two distinct phases during the early 20th century. And you can kind of see with this, this building here, again, it's not necessarily, uh, it's not an example of like a high Tudor Revival architectural style, but you do see some of those more modest influences with the gables and the chimney and so forth. So it's considered a contributing resource to to the district. Resources that are considered non-contributing, uh, they're considered non-contributing if they do not reflect the character of the district. So here's a photograph of a non-contributing resource within the White City Historic District. Um, the general rule for a district is that the majority of resources, or more than 50%, should be, should, should be determined contributing to the district. So if you have you're looking at a district and it has less than a majority of resources that would be contributing, you're not necessarily looking at an eligible historic district. You may need to be looking at something different. Um, for a resource to be non-contributing, uh, it's not contributing typically because of alterations. Uh, think like in addition, um, non-historic materials such as vinyl siding or, you know, window configurations, maybe uh, the garage, for, if it's a residential property, maybe the garage has been um, infilled, something like that. Um, or, you know, a resource could be non-contributing because it lacks an association with the district's significance. Maybe it was built after the period of significance for the district. Um, and so therefore it would be non-contributing for that reason. Um, so those are, you know, usually a property is non-contributing or a resource is non-contributing, excuse me, if it's um, due to alterations or for um, and or its lack of association with the historic significance. Lastly, criterion D, uh, properties that have yielded or may be likely to yield information important to prehistory or history. So for criterion D justification, you need to provide the subcategory of archaeology that best describes the property type. Uh, prehistoric, there, there are three broad categories, prehistoric, historic aboriginal, or historic non-aboriginal. And then you must also provide any categories or subcategories about which the site has provided or is likely to provide information. Um, 
you know, think like agriculture or, or engineering, you know, something like that. So those are two things to keep in mind. The term, uh, the information pot potential, you know, that typically refers to um, archaeological sites. And those sites may be prehistoric or historic. So here's a couple of examples. Um, on the left is the Cooper site in Harper County. Um, it was a bison kill site. It's associated, it was associated with um, Folsom Complex hunters. Uh, likely, you know, the site dates to somewhere between 10,900 and 10,200 BC. Um, it was listed for the information that the site yielded on the hunting activities of indigenous peoples. Uh, numerous artifacts, we, numerous artifacts were uncovered, uh, including arrow points, um, a painted bison skull. And so it was listed because, you know, of the excavation that occurred and the information that it yielded, um, you know, for, um, you know, for that site. Um, to the right is Rose Hill Plantation in Choctaw County. Um, so here's, here's a case where we have, you know, it's, it was listed under Criterion B. And so that's significant persons category. Um, Fourth association with Robert M. Jones. Um, Robert Jones was at one time the wealthiest member of the Choctaw Nation uh, prior to the Civil War. Um, Rose Hill was one of his, I think, seven plantations uh, that he owned prior to the Civil War. Uh, and Rose Hill specifically was was listed under Criterion D for the arc for the archaeological information that it yielded you know, when when excavations took place. Something that we commonly don't think of, but Buildings can also tell us information that are not readily available through other sources. And so buildings can sometimes meet Criterion D designation. This is the, the Vanderson Homestead in Beckham County. It was listed under Criterion A for its association with Exploration Settlement. Um, it's one of the few remaining early settlement homesteads in Western Oklahoma. It was also significant under Criterion D um, for its potential to yield information about half dugout construction during the early settlement of Oklahoma. What's what's kind of difficult to convey in the photograph here is that um, the dugout was actually built in several phases um, between 1896 and 1916. And because it's still standing, um, it still has integrity, as we'll talk about in the next section, um, it's, it's it's able to, to tell us information about how these types of buildings were constructed um, because it's not like you can just go to say the Tulsa Foundation for Architecture and look into look in their library and find drawings that indicate how a structure like this was how a building like this was constructed um, so it's the, it's the actual physical building that gives us that information and so it was listed under criterion D um, as well as criterion A um, for that reason Okay, I'll pause here for questions and then we'll get into uh, our discussion of historic. Uh, I, have, I think we're talking about criteria considerations next, and then we have uh, historic integrity. All right, no questions. Oh, you can see something. Okay, so Anna Eddings asked, when is it necessary to compare a property to similar properties to demonstrate its significance? For example, properties with the same association under criteria under criterion A or architectural style under C. Uh, and Anna, I think for that to answer that question, it, it would largely depend on the context. So if you're thinking about if it's if you're if you're making the argument that the property is significant at the local level, um, that would be okay comparing with similar properties within that local community. So, you know, for instance, we recently reviewed a nomination for a, uh, it was a house in Ponca City that was designed in the contemporary architectural style. It was associated with um, a Tulsa architect. Um, the preparer was able to find the drawings and, and all of that. And he actually, the, the architect designed several other properties, um, you know, 
in Ponca City that were also kind of expressions of the contemporary architectural style. The nomination included a brief discussion of those of those properties, um, in part to show that most of those properties had been significantly altered. And so they were no longer able to convey significance, um, architectural significance under Criterion C for their association with with that architect and with that style due to alterations. And so it kind of helped, it helped increase the, you know, it helped build the case for this, for this individual property um, to be listed. And so that's, I think that's an example of that, that comes to mind. So it's all about, it's all about the context. And if that didn't answer your question, um, if I need to clarify something, please let me know. So criteria considerations, and I've included some examples in the photographs up to this point about properties that that you may have thought, hey, I didn't think I didn't think cemeteries were necessarily eligible, or I didn't think um, properties that were less than 50 years old were were eligible. So there is um, there is some flexibility for this. Um, there are what we call criteria considerations. It's those properties that are normally excluded from National Register eligibility but under certain circumstances, which the National Register calls criteria considerations, um, they can be listed. And so those criteria considerations are, are, are pretty much as follows. In the National Register form, those considerations are laid out. If the property is associated with one of those, you check the box. And in the narrative, you just have to provide, you know, usually it's no more than a paragraph to just to justify, you know, why the property still merits um, National Register listing. Um, criteria consideration A refers to those properties that are owned by a religious institution or used for religious purposes. So here's a photograph of Mount Zion Baptist Church in Tulsa. Um, simply put, for a religious property to be eligible, it must derive primary significance from architecture, his art, its artistic distinction, or historical importance. So in the case of Mount Zion, it, it was listed both for its architecture and for its association um, with African-American history, specifically its association with Greenwood in Tulsa, its association with you know, its, the destruction of the Tulsa Race Massacre, and more importantly, the buildings, its reconstruction um, following the, the Race Massacre. Criteria consideration B refers to buildings that have been moved from their original location. Um, just because a building has been relocated, that doesn't automatically disqualify it from National Register eligibility. Um, I will say, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we oftentimes prefer to be in on those conversations if a property has to be moved. Um, but even if, if a property has been moved, it can still be eligible if it's significant primarily for its architectural value, or if it's the it's a surviving structure that's importantly associated with a historic person or event, and so what's pictured here is um, the Verdon Separate School in Grady County. Um, it's the sole remaining example of a Grady County Separate School, and it was originally situated on a farm in rural Grady County, uh, and it was moved to a pastoral location in Chickasha to prevent its destruction. Basically, the building was threatened with demolition. A group of alumni worked to essentially prevent that from happening. And they worked in consultation with our office. And we, we spent great care in selecting a, a, a site in Chickasha that um, retained as much as possible the original rural setting of the school. And so it's still able, even though it's been moved, you know, it's significant because it's the only surviving structure of its type. Uh, and it's still able to convey that significance, even though it has been moved. So just because the building has been moved, that that's not necessarily an automatic disqualifier, um, but it does have to meet those, those criteria. Criteria consideration C, a birthplace or a grave of a historical figure of outstanding importance. The key, disc, the key thing here is that there is no other appropriate site or building directly associated with their productive, um, with their productive life. And so um, this is the, the Jesse Chisholm gravesite in, in, Bla in, in Blaine County. Um, so 
basically you know, birthplaces or graves can be listed if there is no other resource um, to associate. And at the time that the, the Chisholm gravesite was listed, this was one of our early nominations back in the 70s. Um, um, there, there were no documented sites yet also associated with um, Jesse Chisholm. Since then, we've had a couple of, of trail segments listed and, and so forth. But um, if, this, if this nomination was coming up today, it would have to meet criteria consideration C. Criteria consideration D, a cemetery. Um, typically, cemeteries are not eligible. Um, the cemetery must derive primary significance from, here we go, graves of, of persons of transcendent importance, um, from age, from distinctive design features, or from association with um, historic events. So I had a picture of Fraser Cemetery up earlier. Here's a photograph of the Silver City Cemetery in Grady County. Um, in both of those cases, these cemeteries were listed um, for their association with exploration and settlement. I mean, these both of those cemeteries um, are the only extant resources associated with former town sites um, during the exploration and settlement period of Oklahoma. So um, they you know, they they met that um, they meet that criteria they meet the criteria consideration for to merit listing. Criteria consideration E is a reconstructed building, object, or structure. Um, the key thing here is that the reconstruction must be accurately executed in a suitable environment and presented as part of a restoration master plan when no other building or structure with the same association has survived. So this is a photograph of a, the reconstructed barracks building at Fort Washita in Bryan County. So I'm going to show um, in the next slide kind of an example of, of what doesn't count as a reconstruction. So basically for you know, something to be re to, to meet this criteria consideration, it must be accurately executed. It must be in a suitable environment, um, you know, to keep those things in mind. Because we oftentimes, if you think about, you know, we oftentimes throw out the term, you know, oh, this has been reconstructed. This building has been restored. And here's a case of a of a building that has been restored, but it does not meet um, the eligibility requirements. This is the, a um, it's known it's in Ponca City. It's known as the uh, the Four Arches Barn in Ponca City. It was um, located at the at the south end of uh, E. W. Marlin's estate. Um, supposedly, uh, Marlin hired masons to to design and construct the barn prior to. Uh, designing and constructing uh, his mansion um, for the north. Um, in the upper left is a historic photograph of how the barn appeared historically. So you can kind of see the notable um, four arches. You can see uh, the, the roof. Um, and the barn was in ruins for many years. The, the roof had collapsed. Um, uh, and you can see kind of the changes to the, to the setting that had taken place. Uh, and then uh, we recently got word, the reason why I put this up here is because we recently got word about the barn having been reconstructed. And, you know, we, we got photographs sent to us and, you know, we see the, I mean, the, the four arches themselves were, um, were somewhat preserved, but you see the, the amount of alterations that also happened. It's now a, a real estate office, uh, but you see the arch, the arches have been infilled. Um, you know, the, the roof, the roof line is, has somewhat been reconstructed but you see the the dormers in the roof line you see the enormous parking lot out front um you know this one at, and we, i bring this up because we actually got asked you know hey would this would this meet would this be eligible for the national register and and um you know i was in town that day went out there and looked at it and um you know like i said earlier i will process any nomination that comes before my desk um but this is a case that it would be a stretch to see if this property would meet uh, this criteria consideration for being a reconstructed property because of the alterations that have happened. Criteria consideration F, uh, a commemorative property. So, or, um, you know, it's a property that's commemorative in intent of design, age or tradition, um, or perhaps it's a property that um, it's symbolic value has invested it with its own historical significance. 
Um, and an example of this is the Oklahoma City National Memorial. Um, associated, of course, with the um, 1995 bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, um, but criteria it does meet the just it does meet the criteria consideration F, uh, you know, because the memorial is it's it is a commemorative property. So typically, these types of properties are not eligible. Um, it's also less than 50 years old. Uh, we'll get that to that in the next slide. Um, but justification also had to be made for this property to meet criteria consideration F. Essentially that the argument was that the symbolic value of the memorial has attained significance since the bombing. You know, since the memorial, you know, has an, it's been it's become invested with its own historic significance. So the other part of this was less than 50 years of age or criteria consideration G. So just because a property is not 50 years old, it doesn't automatically disqualify um, a property from eligibility. Uh, you just have to show that you know it's you know that it's achieved that significance. It's essentially of exceptional importance. And so this is pictured here is United Founders Life Tower in Oklahoma City. Um, it was listed in 2013. Uh, and the period of significance was 1962 to 1964 when the building was designed <coughs> and and constructed. At that time, in, 20, in 2013, it was just less than 50 years of age, and so criteria consideration G had to be, um, you know, that criteria consideration had to be met. And the preparers made the argument that it was of, of exceptional importance under criterion C uh, because it was the the, really the first modern skyscraper of distinction in the state since construction of Price Tower in 1955. And more so, it was one of only two circular skyscrapers in the state. And they went on to make the argument that, you know, the construction of this tower in the mid-60s helped catalyze the development um, of this sector of Northwest Oklahoma City, inspired the construction of, of other high-rise buildings um, in the area. So, you know, just because it was less than 50 years old at the time of listing, you know, they 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 kind of I guess went that extra mile, so to speak, to 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 show why it still merited listing, even though it was less than 50 years of age at the time. And another thing to keep in mind about that um, less than 50 years of age is, you know, here's a photograph of suburban sprawl in Tulsa in the in the mid to late 1960s. Um, we're coming up more and more with um, properties that 10, 15 years ago were not of age. Um, they're now reaching that they're now 50 years of age or they're getting, um, they're, they're meeting that they're coming close to that threshold. I just got a phone call this morning about, um, a mall in Midwest city built in, I think 1978. So again, right on that, right on that threshold. Um, and so, you know, that's just something to keep in mind. These are, you know, we're having, more and more properties that are now of the quote unquote recent, recent past that are becoming um, eligible or are, you know, they're, they merit um, consideration for potential eligibility. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. And, and the Park Service is, you know, continuing to, to put out literature and technical papers about how to best, um, let's say like how to best evaluate suburban neighborhoods, um, those types of things. So. Um, you know, if you have any questions about a particular property, even if even if it's less than 50 years of age, don't hesitate to, to contact me. All right, any questions before we get to the last part of the presentation? I apologize for lying when I said, oh, I think this will take about an hour. Uh, this will probably take about little over an hour and a half. I apologize for that. That's why we booked the two hours. If not, we'll get to the last part of, there are no questions, we'll get to the last part of the presentation. Again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to include them in the Q&A tab or under the chat function, and then we will have time after the presentation to address any last minute um, questions that you might have. But let's look at um, integrity. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that integrity and condition are not the same thing. 
Just because a building is in poor condition does not mean it has lost its historic integrity. Vacant or deteriorated buildings are often nominated to the National Register because designation can stimulate or incentivize interest in redeveloping that property for a modern use. So, so long as the property meets the National Register criteria, you know, so it meets that criteria for significance and it has historic integrity, it is eligible for listing. One important thing to keep in mind if, if someone in the audience um, is, is, is in this situation, um, don't wait to don't wait don't wait until your restoration or rehabilitation project is done before pursuing National Register eligibility. Um, oftentimes, uh, the best practice is to use a National Register nomination to help guide the restoration and rehabilitation effort. Um, the photograph here is of Edward Store uh, in Latimer County. This is a textbook example of this. There's a group that's actually, you know, going about rehabilitating and restoring this log building to its historic um, appearance. And they're using, you know, they've just recently updated the nomination to help guide that work. So in terms of integrity, there are seven aspects to, to look at. We look at location, design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. Um, I'll include here at the end, property does not necessarily need to uh, convey aspects of all seven of integrity. And oftentimes one thing to keep in mind is, you know, those most, uh, you know, pay attention to why your property is significant. Um, if a property is, is significant under criterion C, then yeah, things like integrity of materials, design, those may be, you know, of higher, um, you know, those are, those are maybe priorities um, or they, they may take higher importance. Whereas if it's a property that's associated with a significant event, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, there's greater leeway in some cases for, um, for integrity. So let's look at these in, in more detail. The first one being location. A couple of questions to think about. Has the property been moved from its historic or original location? And if so, if the property has been moved, how does that affect its ability to convey its significance? So this is a photograph of a railroad depot. Uh, this was the LaFleur Depot. Um, it was originally built in 1887 and it has since been removed, you know, moved and relocated to uh, the Oklahoma Railway Museum in Oklahoma City. Um, so it's no longer in its historic location. It's been, you can see it's been, um, it's been restored or it's being restored and, and all of that, um, but it's been taken away from its historic location. It's been taken away from its historic setting and so therefore wouldn't necessarily be um, individual eligible because it lacks integrity in part, it lacks integrity of location. Uh, design. Has the original appearance of the resource been, been altered? And do the alterations impact the original design um, intent? So essentially design refers to the overall form, plan, scale, and massing of a building, as well as its spatial organization and architectural style. New windows, new door openings, uh, the alteration of a storefront, those are all design changes that they must, and they must be looked at carefully to determine if the design has been compromised. So like in the case, this is the Cleveland County Courthouse and note the enormous um, addition um, built behind uh, the original historic building. Setting. You know, how has the setting of the property changed? And do significant changes in setting affect a property's ability to convey its historic significance? So integrity of setting is particularly important for historic districts because it ties those individual resources together as an ensemble. So whether urban, suburban, or rural, setting contributes in powerful ways to a, his, to a historic property's sense of place. Incompatible additions or new construction can compromise the integrity of setting in a variety of ways, including dramatically changing the ratio of built space to open space on a property or interrupting the consistency of building spacing and setbacks within a district. And so like here's a photograph of, of, a, of a rural farmstead uh, the location of it indicated by the the red arrow, and note the the you know the um, the, the subdivision that was built um, built to the north, and so 
um, does it completely, you know, it doesn't completely detract from the property's integrity of setting, but, um, you know, if, if continued development takes place on those adjacent parcels, you know, then that is something to keep in mind. Materials. Have inappropriate materials been added to the resource? Integrity in terms of materials recognizes the important contribution that exterior building materials make to a property's sense of place and time. Those materials reflect owner's preferences, local availability, and the building technology of the period. They're all part of the building's significance, and again, they help place that building, uh, they help contribute to its sense of place and time. And so, you know, think about well, what can change integrity of materials? Well, um, how about non-historic siding that infills um, historic stone fronts, or, or it's not stone fronts, storefronts, as you see um, on the first floor. Um, inappropriate windows, um, and even the window openings themselves have been partially infilled to, um, you know, to, to accommodate uh, the non-historic windows. You know, all those detract from uh, integrity of materials. The, the original historic materials are no longer you know, extant. The historic um, storefront windows and transoms, those are no longer there. Um, even you can tell where some of the, the uh, um, looks like perhaps some of the brick, um, some of the original exterior, exterior material has been uh, replaced with new brick, perhaps. So all of that takes away from integrity of materials. Workmanship. Workmanship recognizes the importance of local building traditions, earlier technology, and the craft of the workers to historic properties. It may be simple and straightforward, or it could be elaborate or complex. However, like materials, workmanship is critical to a property's sense of place and time, and preserving it is essential to preserving the overall integrity of a property. So in terms of integrity of workmanship, ask the question, have alterations, additions, or repairs match the historic fabric in terms of workmanship or craftsmanship? Uh, these photographs here are um, of the Oklahoma Center for Continuing Education uh, in, in Norman, um, listed under Criterion C for its architectural merit, in part due to the high, high integrity of the property's historic fabric. Note the exposed brick walls, note the, the staircase and, and railings, um, all of which are historic and original. Note the, note the tile um, still conveys a high integrity of, of materials and, and workmanship and design. The, the last two here are kind of the more, they're the, they're the less tangible or they're kind of the, they're the, the, the accumulation of these other aspects of integrity. So in terms of feeling, you know, does, does the property feel right? Uh, do the other factors of integrity work together to convey the historic qualities of, of the resource? So the image here is of the Eastern Oklahoma tu uh, Tuberculosis Sanatorium. It was opened in 1921. It was a segregated facility. It was open only to white Oklahomans suffering from tuberculosis. But think about the ways in which the factors of integrity previously discussed contribute to the property's integrity of feeling. Look at the location set on a hillside. Look at integrity of setting. It's a rural setting. You know, over, you know there's you, you're not seeing um, widespread development uh, in the immediate vicinity. So still kind of is still able to convey that. Um, you know, the preservation of the, the brick exterior. Um, so it still conveys, you know, historic materials, you know, design and workmanship. All those aspects of integrity um, are there. There are some things of note. Um, it looks like some of the windows have either, are the windows themselves are either no longer extant or possibly, or are damaged. Um, but the, you know, the window openings themselves are still there. They haven't been infilled and, and that type of thing. So that's, you know, does, does the property feel right? And then lastly, association. Is the resource really associated with its historic past? And this is a relatively recent um, nomination, um, but association may be association with a specific entity. Think like a mill or institution with a, or with a historic use, such as a suburb, main street, warehouse. Um, if the association is important to the significance of the property, its use and occupancy are important to its ongoing integrity. 
So this is a photograph of Nine Tribes Tower in Miami, in Ottawa County. Um, it was listed for its association with social history, specifically as it was the only low-income high-rise public project constructed, public housing project, excuse me, constructed for senior citizens by the Miami Housing Authority. It's still utilized for senior housing. And so it's able to maintain that historic, that association with its historic past, it's still, associated, it's still associated with its historic use. Resident, you know, in this case, residential um, for, for senior citizens. <clears throat> a couple of examples, uh, and this actually goes to Anna's question earlier. This is the, um, of how you know, properties can, can lose integrity over time. Um, this is the Constance Cleary House in Ponca City. Um, the top photo was taken in 2013 during a survey. The bottom photo was taken uh, during the preparation of a craft of a draft nomination. Uh, the nomination was attempting to make the argument that the property was significant under Criterion C for uh, association with a contemporary architectural style and um, association with uh, a Tulsa-based architect. In the 2022 photo, you can see a couple of key key changes. One thing that was always going to be of concern was the garage. And in the, the job of the nomination preparer was, you know, they did need to determine whether was the garage um, ever part of the property's historic design or was it a, a, a subsequent addition. Turns out it was a non-historic addition. It was added at some point in the, the late 1970s or early 1980s. The other thing you, can, you should notice in the bottom photograph is if you look at the top left, the entrance is obscured. In the bottom right, you can see that the entrance has been relocated, and it's now prominently you know, it's, it's very visible um, towards the middle of of the building. And that was part of because lo and behold, as the nomination got underway, turns out the property owner was doing widespread renovations to the building. And so, other things to keep in note was um, you note in the bottom right photograph here, compared with the bottom with the with the upper left, you know, in the upper left, a lot of those you know historic windows. Um, along along that elevation had been maintained. You know, by the time the draft nomination was prepared, all of those windows had been replaced by one over one vinyl vinyl sashes, non-historic materials, not in the historic configuration. And so, with all those alterations, um, this was a case where it was a draft nomination, and you know, we got to the point where we're like, we don't think this is eligible. And so, the nomination didn't move forward after that point. Um, but so, a couple of things to keep in mind is that. Not all seven aspects of integrity need to be present, so long as the overall sense of past time and place is evidence. Um, and number two, nominations must include an analysis of integrity to assess how the property is able to convey significance. And oftentimes, again, that can be just like a paragraph in the nomination form that just discusses how it meets um, those different aspects of integrity. Or even if 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 one aspect of integrity is lacking, you know why the property still has sufficient integrity um, for listing. All right. Well, that concludes uh, the presentation. Um, I'll take a few moments here to allow any um, uh, last minute questions. It does look like, um, I don't think we have um, any questions as of now. Um, but I'm happy to to pause for a couple of minutes here and, and let folks type in any questions they may have. If you're thinking of any questions while you're doing that, I will mention uh, I do have several handouts available uh, in under the handouts tab, uh, including our fact sheets. I have a copy of the National Register Manual uh, that's in the process of being updated um, as we speak. I'd hope to have it completely updated before the presentation, but that unfortunately did not happen. Um, another thing that may be of note is our nomination submittal requirements. Um, those have been updated since I arrived at this position. And so you can take a look at that PDF and provides a, a handy guide um, for, um, you know, for how to submit nominations. And again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to contact me. I do have a couple of slides here on um, you know, some useful direct links. Um, 
we have several links available on our website through our national resources uh, or national register page. Um, Another thing to keep in mind, um, the National Register of Historic Places through the Park Service, they have their own publications page. Um, it includes their bulletins on how to apply National Register criteria, how to complete National Register forms. One thing of note, and I forgot to attach it to this presentation, um, but I can make it available for anybody if, if you want to reach out to me. Um, the National Park Service has started to do what's called best practices review, and they're starting to issue, um, you know, their basically technical papers on specific topics. Um, issue one that was released earlier this year was on evaluating non-historic e exteriors, um, mainly like vinyl siding and things like that. Um, essentially kind of addressing the question like, well, if a house has exterior, has non-historic um, exterior materials, think like vinyl siding or something like that, can it still be eligible? Um, and the Park Service provided some case studies of, you know, when and where um, that could be the case. So um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask them. I'm not seeing anything. Um, Jeanette, I, saw your, I see your comment about the Masonic building in um, Marietta. If you could provide me with your email address, I would be happy to send that any, any information we have on that, on that building uh, via email after the presentation. Now stick around for, so to give you time to, to enter that. If you don't have any further questions, um, you know, again, there's my contact information. Um, and tomorrow I'm giving a presentation on researching historic properties. I hope to see, um, see you all there. Um, and um, with that, have a, have a great day. This concludes the, the presentation.